more zeros. So I go all the way to the end here, and I'm hoping to goodness that I get a blank at the end of all the symbols that I checked off instead of a 1. Pretty simple strategy. It's going to take us half a board to write this up. Now, how would you do this in a program? Somebody reads in an array, say, of, of, of characters, and you're supposed to tell whether the first half is zeros and the second half ones. How would you do it? Would you do it much differently? How would you do it? Okay, right, so you would use a counter. You would actually start from here and, and say, you know, for i equals 1, 2, you, you count the length of this whole thing, and then you check whether the first n over 2 of them were, uh, were zeros by some loop that goes through. Now, you could do that on the Turing machine, too, except we'd have to first build a counter. And every time we'd see a zero, we'd have to move over to that area of the tape that has the counter and add one to it and move all the way back. Maybe it's a better strategy than this marking off strategy. Maybe not. But we just thought of this marking off strategy. OK? So there's more general ways to do it. Any way you can think of doing it in a program, I could simulate on the Turing machine. But maybe brute force, your first gut instinct wouldn't be to do that on a Turing machine because it's too much of a mess. All right, let's try to write this. Here's our start state. If we see a 0, what do we put? We'll put an x on it, and we'll move to the right. Okay, so I'm xing off zeros. Now what? You write this machine for me. I got it down here. If you make a mistake, I'll ch fix it. Skip all the zeros that you see. I agree. That's a good idea. Skip all the zeros. How do you skip zeros? If you see a 0, write a 0 on top of it. You can leave a symbol the way it was by just writing it over on top of it. So you can move over any symbols you want and then move to the right. Because when we come back, we've got to know that we, that we looked at it. We're going to be checking each one of these against each one of the ones. All right. All right, now what? All right. Those of you who are so forward-looking as to notice that we might have to add something else in this loop, good. And we'll come back and do it later when you realize it. Huh? What do we get next? When you find a 1. When you find a 1? Yeah, I'm putting a y. I want to distinguish it from the other symbol. I'm not sure I need to, but I'm doing it anyway. And then go back left. Now what? All the way back. This is the lowest level of understanding how a Turing machine works. We're actually writing the implementation. We're writing the details down. A little higher level would be what I said at the beginning. A Turing machine, to recognize this kind of string, will start matching symbols one at a time. Seeing the zero, skip over all the zeros and then match it with a one, mark it with special symbols, go all the way back and do the same thing. If the symbols match up and there's no extra ones and there's no extra blanks at the end, it accepts. That's a second level, a little higher level of abstraction. And then maybe the highest level, and these, these three levels are actually, uh, Mike Sipser talks about them in your text and it's worth reading them. The highest level is, well, Here's a scheme program that does this. And a Turing machine can do anything a scheme program does. So I'm done. That's like what Chris said before about the counting level. So he talks about, when should you do which level? So at the beginning, do this for a while until you get the sense of what it is. And then move up a level where you start talking about descriptions that are a little higher level, but still talk about how the Turing machine would do it. And then when you're convinced Turing machines can really do everything, either you're convinced because you really believe it or just because you want to say that you believe it, then you can start talking about higher level descriptions that, OK, I wrote a scheme program to do it or a Java program to do it. All right, enough of that. Blah, blah, blah. Let's go on. Go back. How do we go back, Joe? What, what transitions do I need here? You need to uh, count zeros, pull top zeros, or check the top of the stack for zero. There's no stacks. Uh, the tape for zero, write a zero, and then move left until you hit an X. But I haven't gotten back yet. We got Y's on the ones. We got we got when we're going back now we gotta skip over those Y's. So if I see a Y, just leave it and go back. Okay. Right? Because there's gonna be Y's 
behind me when I turn around, and I got to go over them. And then what you said is right. We skip over the uh, skip over the zeros also. Okay. Right, right. We need to skip over the y's here. Right. On, Wait, right. No, it's the y's. We need to skip over the y's going forward. Why don't we wait until we actually come back forward through the loop to put that in? Everybody's going, ah, what are you talking about? We'll fix that. All right. At this point, where do we go? Go back to the first state. And when we see a, an x, we leave the x, move to the right, and now we're ready to read the next zero. This is a little different than the push down machine. Okay. Yeah. Could you like draw, show this on a tape? I mean, what it's actually going to do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's let me finish writing, and then and then we'll show the configurations. Is that what you mean? Yeah. What, yeah, yeah. And you think I should do it right now? Um, yeah, maybe. You can make it uh, I'll do it right now. Just let me say one thing. You'll notice here. There's a loop. This is no more or less than the regular for loops in all your programming languages. This is what it's saying. It's saying. Go ahead, look for a zero, check it off, and go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. And we're going to put a little condition in here that tells us when to stop doing the loop, and that'll be a transition out. So, you know, I could spend a whole week trying to convince you that Turing machines can do loops, Turing machines can do if then else statements, Turing machines can do arrays, Turing machines can do random access into an array, Turing machines can do stacks and queues, Turing machines can do recursion, Turing machines can do objects. But I kind of want you to internalize that yourselves. It's, it's a lot of work, and it's something that'll just, you'll feel after a while. What does it look like after we've gone through this loop once? That's through a few steps of our Turing machine. It looks like x, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, y, 1, 1, bb. If I give you this picture, somebody just came in and tripped over the Turing machine's cord. All right? So it turned off. And we want to turn it back on and continue from where we were before. Just like in your computers when some I.O. device interrupts your program and then you want to keep going. In architecture, what happens to your program when somebody says stop and then says, OK, now go on where you were before? What does the machine do? It remembers the program counter. It remembers uh, the values of all the registers. What does it do? It takes a picture of the machine. It says, snapshot, click. I'm going to store this over here. And when you're all ready to go back, I'll put everything back in. What does a Turing machine need to store that takes a picture of itself? It's got to name this thing. It's called a configuration. A configuration of a Turing machine is a picture of the state of the Turing machine right now. So if you had it, you could continue from there. Well, this is part of it. The tape is part of it. What else do you need besides the tape? The position of the, of the head and, and what state you're in. Right? That's enough. If you know what state you're in and where you are, what symbol you're looking at, you're OK. So configurations are often written like this, with the state of where you are, written in between two symbols, with the convention that the state is about to look at the symbol to its right. So in this case, what does it really look like? I'm going to rewrite this and give you a better picture. Where are we right now over here? Where we just read this x. And we've moved left. And we moved, we moved right. Oh, it does move right. OK. Right, it moves right. So we're sitting here about to look at the 0. So we write, and what state are we in? Let's number these states, a, b, and c. We're in state a. About to look at a 0, and the rest of the tape looks like this. I'm going to put a big circle around this. That's a configuration. That's a picture of the machine right now. State A, about to read a 0, and that's what the tape looks like. If I put a lot of these configurations one after the other, that's a history of what the Turing machine did. That's called a computation. A bunch of configurations, one of which comes from the other one, is a history of what the Turing machine did. It's a computation. Some strings get accepted by Turing machines. And they leave a long history behind them of a set of configurations which end up getting accepted. And that's called a valid computation, because it made it to the end and it accepted. 